Hello, I'm Sharon Ross with Capital City Arts Initiative. Today we are in the Courthouse Gallery and we have invited Stefan Reed to interview Sam Osserhoff about his exhibition, Plastic Musings. We hope you enjoy the interview. Okay, hey Sam. Good morning. Nice, uh, congratulations on the exhibit. Thank you so much. Uh, Pleasure. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to start off maybe just talking about um, kind of how you got to this place. I know you're not too far removed from your degree um, at UNR and can maybe just talk about why you decided to go to school for, for an art degree and, and what you thought about that process. Sure, yeah, in high school I fell in love with drawing and um, decided I wanted to be an artist. Well, I decided that earlier in life but kind of took off and noticed I had some sort of talent more than others. And, Decided right after high school to go to college at UNR and study painting and the fine arts. Uh, about a year and a half, two years in, I realized I wasn't ready for college. I was pretty young still. So I packed up my bags and left for Seattle about seven years or so and had an opportunity to come back home to Carson where I grew up and um, yeah, finished my degree. And when I started, you know, there was just a lot of turmoil in my brain deciding like, can I actually make a profession with painting or drawing and being an artist and right. of course there's all this pressure with parents and like yeah, what are right. you going to do with that and yeah. I don't know right. so I think that kind of threw me off but once I went back as a young adult you know 27 years old I realized like why not do this like they offer it in the college so right. I'm going to take it and take the opportunity to get a degree in something that you know I've always loved and been obsessed with and right. let's go for it so so can I ask you, because this is interesting, because I had a similar experience that in high school or when I was younger, I had a little aptitude for drawing and art, um, loved art classes, mm -hmm. um, but it was never talked about in my family as a viable kind of pursuit, mm -hmm. right? And do, do, do you think if that would have been at a younger age, you would have been in a better place? Or I think, yeah, if I had more support and more conversation about the possibilities yeah. or just the idea of like just go for it right. you know what do you have to lose you could always go back and study something else like yeah i think that could have helped especially at you know 18 19 you don't know as much as you think you know right yeah and the uh the program um you're at, at the unr um mm -hmm. you like some of the classes that I mean, was there something that really kind of informed you in that process uh or there was something that um, okay, what's the question I'm trying to ask here is, um, was, there, was there something in that that was really informative that maybe you would not have gotten outside of that kind of academic setting? Um, specific teachers for sure in the second round when I went back to school, opened my brain up to the arts and just right. thinking about things. Um, yeah, I wish I would have focused more initially. I think it would have benefited me more in the long run, right. but when I went back, I think you know, you could say it's meant to be that my brain was set up for that at that time. Right. And then I worked with, you know, right. Austin Pratt and his classes really exploded my brain. And then working under Michael Sarich right. before he left. And right. yeah, that was extremely beneficial. Excellent. The way they thought about art. And yeah. So um, looking at several of the, the paintings that you have here, um, and I'm going to call them paintings, but I know there's a lot more going on other than paint. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was looking at these two here, um, maybe you can just talk about kind of your process, just just a tad bit. Uh, I don't know how linear it is, if, if you start with um, paint or if material kind of starts and then informs your painting. Mm -hmm. um, but these two paintings here are really kind of different to me, um, not only kind of through the hues and the, the textures, um, but uh, there's something about the, this light color one over here that resonates with me with, with some stenciling and stuff like that. But maybe you can talk about your process on how maybe this evolved and then maybe the difference between this one, this painting, and the painting that's next to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think before I start any painting, um, a lot of it is either very specifically thought about and dictated, and then a lot of it is just completely subconscious, gestural sort of creative in the moment right so this one was very much in the moment building itself as i went i sort of started with a background 
And lately I've been focusing on layering, is what I call it, and kind of building up, adding and subtracting layers to eventually get to a place of like all this information and almost a story of where you think you know where I started and how I got to this point versus this point. And uh, maybe a quarter of the way through I found these fabrics and decided I loved the colors, I loved the patterns, and I knew I wanted it to be on the painting. So they were kind of in the studio, on the side, and the rest of the painting sort of built itself upon playing with these certain textiles and fabrics here that eventually went into the canvas. These two, obviously on top, ended up that way. This one was cut in and uh, sewed in. But yeah, this one was very, very much free form, just, you know, letting it kind of build itself. Correct, so, so I'm kind of curious, so uh, this is cut out with uh, this, this fabric that's sewn in and this one appears to be on top. Mm -hmm. uh, is there kind of something that maybe would inform you why or I need to cut this out and sew here or maybe lay some material on top? Um, I mean, which definitely gives it this layered or a relief effect mm -hmm. of, of the work. Um, I'm kind of curious how some of that you know, behind the yeah. painting, on top of the painting, um, the sewn. Uh, yeah, you know, I'd like to say there's some important significance behind the decision, right. but what really came out was I did this one first and realized it was much more difficult to get it set in place after the canvas had been stretched. Right. So part of the process is building upon itself, so I realized, well, I'll just stick these ones on top and find the right place for them, and, you know, but then in the end, it does make you know, a conversational piece, whether inside your brain or actually verbally, right. to like why is that difference? And then, you know, hopefully the viewer kind of contemplates what's going on. And right. that's the goal of painting is to make you think, so. Well, the composition, right? The, the, this, the composition of this really, really works for me, right? And I'm always fascinated by why something works so well and it has so much mm -hmm. information going on, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot happening in that painting mm -hmm. with, with the lines and the, the, the broad strokes of what's going on, the various colors, um, the screening of, of, of paint through here, but yet it all kind of works in the end, mm -hmm. right? And I'm kind of curious in something like this, um, how you're comfortable or, or when you're, you're at a point where you can say, okay, I think that works, mm -hmm. right? After all this that I've done, um, I, I hate to say, you know, when a painting's finished, but yeah. when you're comfortable with the composition at the end. No, I, I love that because the idea that I like to hold is you don't know until you know, and it's, it's not really something you could teach. It's something that has to be learned, I think, through painting. And we always talked about it in classes. Is it's, there's a language to a painting, and it talks back to you. You put a color on or a gestural mark, and it speaks to you, and you have to kind of resonate with it. And eventually you develop this language with your work that it talks to you, you talk back and find that cohesiveness. And once you find that, it's this feeling you get, it's just, it's complete, right? right, right. But you also can't be afraid to just attack the painting is what Michael Sarich used to say, just attack it. The worst thing that happens, yeah. you can paint over it. Yeah. And like, when I really believe that, it's like, right. oh man, that, there's no wrong answer. You could always so change it, you and adapt. Yeah, yeah. yeah it loosens you up. It frees you. Yeah. And it like, frees you, yeah. After that, you know, it's infinite. Yeah, right. But it is that language that you develop with your paintings and your work that you have to listen, right? Is there, is there, a, you've, you've been doing this for a while now, so if you sit with a painting over a long period of time, say six months, a year, will you go back and rework a painting after that kind of period? Or so there's some paintings time? I've sat with for, yeah, years, just staring at it, knowing it's not complete, not knowing what to do, you know, and once in a while, maybe you'll have a dream and, or an idea of going to bed and, you know, the idea is there. Sometimes you yeah. just start over, give yeah. up, you know, yeah. it just depends on what you're feeling, what you're after. Right. Yeah. So can you explain possibly right here, this, the, the painting that's next to you? Yeah. Uh, and so in contrast to this one, which was fully just on, you know, on a whim sort of creation, this one was completely deliber deliberate and my idea of, I wanted to create a painting that's soft. What is that? Like, because I have all these hard marks and these big bright colors. So I said to myself, well, I want a soft painting. What is that? What does that mean? And so I started to build this one and just kind of slowly moved into it. It's more deliberate with my actions and my thoughts. And um, 
you know, I found this fabric in class, knew I wanted to use it. I didn't even do the pink part, but I found it and loved that, you know, kind of marking on the raw canvas, right. which influenced a lot of the rawness in the rest of it. And yeah, just really slowed down on this one. Um, did some stenciling here. You know, I had some fabric that I really liked and spray painted yeah. and get this effect on it that just gives it this kind of airy softness. And yeah. I think, uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's definitely, I think, soft is something um, that it does have the, some of the textures. Um, you know, this, this fabric here seems a lot softer. Um, the, this, you know, had this, um, not to bring up any other artists, but, you know, this, you know, Gerhard Richter's photographs, mm -hmm. those blurred yeah. photographs, right, are really... I kind of love the way that this is kind of permeating. It's uh, dreamy. It is, it is, it is yeah. dreamy, right? It's foggy, dreamy. Mm -hmm. um, so, which is interesting, you know, that kind of contrast between this uh, and this other painting yeah. over here. Um, but, but it sounds like the process is similar, even though it's a completely different painting. Mm -hmm. You go about the work in, in the same kind of way. Right, yeah. Certain pieces build onto other pieces and, you know, it's taking those pieces and piecing them together. And like, right. Yeah, trying to find that cohesiveness. Right. So, it's interesting that you found this fabric here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And how something that could be so inconsequential, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you could, you could bypass that a thousand times in your life. Yeah. And it never, right, inform you it was of anything. It's a scrap pile, right? right? Yeah. It's a scrap pile. Right? Yeah. But to, to be that and in tune mm -hmm. to something of this kind of, um, of this caliber and say that is going to <laughs> inform right. this, right? That's yeah. a cool kind of process yeah. to me. Right? I think it's a good way to live too, is finding those little beauties in you know, the mundane and like right. or finding that little bit of control in the madness of life. And like, right. You know. Right. So um, this diptych here, uh, and it's entitled One Idea of a Painting. Um, so this is um, interesting to me because um, they're so kind of different. Mm -hmm. um, there's some uh, commonality, mm -hmm. some themes that are running through each, mm -hmm. but um, they are um, really different in, in some aspects. Um, so can you maybe just talk about um, did one, did, did it initially start off as a diptych or did you have 
maybe some remnant material that you wanted to add to something else and then it turned into a dip diptych. Yeah, no, this one was really fun in concept because I wanted to challenge the idea of what a painting is, right? You say, what is a painting? And right. What does that make you think in your brain and how do you define that? And then what is the non-painting? So you take that and you just flip it, the yin and yang, right? Like so, this was my idea of one painting as in like, oh, this is a painting I'm presenting the viewer, right? It's very painterly, you know, traditionally, a lot of oils and acrylic and, you know, the layering I was talking about and, you know, taping and all these things is just, it's more of the process down that traditional painting road in my practice. And of course I have the fabric and sort of started with that and knew I wanted that in both pieces. So then you go to this one and it's like, what is the idea? If this is a painting, what is a non-painting, right? So this one, I didn't use any brushes. Um, this again was stenciled on with spray paint. So it's a different application in the way I presented the paint on the canvas. Um, I literally flipped the fabric to the other side, which kind of gives it this different look to it. You get some mm. more texture right. versus the seamed here. Yeah. This is, um, you know, I just try to play with the Roy G. Biv coloring, right? And then so I cut out these shapes and that's more of like the craft aspect. Just glued it to the canvas. And this was just some cardboard I had that my uncle left behind after going to the shooting range. He was right. visiting and I just loved the look of it. So I decided to put that on and, you know, approached it just in the idea of a non-painterly aspect and more of almost sculptural with the idea that, you know, I'm playing with the actual idea and the concept and the belief of what a painting is and what a painting's allowed to be. Um, so you mentioned Roy G. Biv? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, can, can, can you just talk about that just a little bit? Because I don't know much about Roy G. Biv. Or what the, the, so, I mean, I, I know that you have children, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, and when, so when I was seeing these, right, yeah. I thought that, you know, you might have been in the studio, the kids were slapping, yeah. right, the craft project <laughs> on the bottom, uh -huh. which I've kind of loved that idea of, yeah. of the process. Um, but it, I love that idea of the process, but visually it was killing me, right? Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't take it. I, I didn't. There was something about that that really made the diptych disjointed, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but as I sit with it, right, and we talk about it. Um, it's disjointed already because mm -hmm. this is so different than this piece over here. Mm -hmm. um, there is like I, I love this idea of just turning this backwards. You know, it it it, it blurs it a bit. Um, uh, the soft stenciling that you were talking about here gives it that foggy feeling versus the hard lines that mm -hmm. we talked about over here. Um, so that's interesting to me, but I don't know much about um, the idea of this right here. Well, I'd just say that you know you're taught as a young age, and you know there's. I love the childlike practice in right. art and just, you know, that need for a kid to just put a crayon to paper, like what is that? And if you could hold on to that throughout your artistic career, I think that's very important in your creative process and like not losing that childlike thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So with this, I think that's kind of a nod to that. And the Roy G. Biv is the color spectrum of the rainbow, obviously, and plays with the idea of color theory that moves into more formal painting practice, right? The idea right. Of certain colors and interacting and the blending of colors and whatnot. It all kind of stems from this, but it's that beginning, you know, right. so it's like this kind of childlike cutting and crafting this right. felt and putting it together and messy and... So that, that's thing. interesting. So this is hard for me to kind of articulate, but mm -hmm. it, it, on the spot, but it's, it, it's important for you. I, uh, so now that that really kind of opens my eyes up to a lot yeah, of different right. things here, right, as in your work, is yeah. that you have made, right, it's extremely important for you to maintain this idea yeah. of that freedom of allowing yourself to do whatever you want, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. which kind of a start, is starting to express itself now, mm -hmm. right, in these pains, which I can see now to see that and to have a formal academic painting background, right. I'm curious how you, you, you're able to kind of bring those two things together, right? Because yeah. it, it seems like one always is trampling on the other, yeah. right? When you're trying to be free, when you're trying to be loose, you got this academia in your, in your head possibly beating you down 
to do something else, mm -hmm. right? And I'm interested in how you kind of navigate that space. Yeah, I can tell you back to where we were talking in the beginning about school. When I first started, I really tried to do more um, representational art and really, you know, rendered mm -hmm. art and put the oil to the canvas and create exactly what I wanted to see in my brain. And I think it drove me crazy to where I could never please myself with my paintings and what I wanted to do and like make them look like I saw other people doing and like comparing, you know. Right. So when I went back to school, I could say I broke my brain like that. Just I went back to that childlike freedom yeah. and that yeah. no control and attacking the painting, that whole idea of it, and like it just felt better in me. Right. I was happier to do it, and it, you know, I found that I needed to paint more, and you know, with right. that freedom allowed just yeah, a better space for creation and talking about art and exploring the abstract right. rather than the rendered and representational. So yeah, yeah, yeah completely changed everything. And, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, it's um, uh, it's you know this is it's a great diptych. I, it's um, I, I love the disjointedness of of the of the form and the colors, um, and the more that we talk about it, the more I love it. Which yeah, is, which is great. I love that it challenged you. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm always yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy to challenge me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, so thanks, thanks for, t yeah. for talking about that one. A question that I, I, I'm thinking about, that I don't often think about when I'm making work, um, but it, it's always uh, seems to be a relevant question, is kind of audi audience engagement, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, do you think about that at all when you're, when you're kind of in the throes of, of making um, and uh, what you want your viewers to, to perceive? Or is it just kind of this self-absorbed thing of process, the formal, I, I, I'm good with it when it's done, and let the chips fall where they may with the, with the, with the audience. Um, and I think some of the reason I'm asking that is, like this, this, this piece here, it's got some shapes, some motifs that kind of resonate with me, and they're, they're kind of giving me this reaction of something. So I'm curious if that's important, mm -hmm. right? If you're thinking about that when you're in the throes of making this work. Yeah, um, when I was in the midst of this one, you know, I was very much into the idea of patterns, whether it's patterns in the textiles I was looking at or old traditional patterns that we see, you know, or I found myself looking in the outside world and finding patterns and textiles and textures everywhere. And like some I was really attracted to and some, you know, I could live without. Um, this one started because I loved the chevron lines and I knew I wanted to do some really clean lines and I think something with pattern um, that I think about with viewership and audience is I know there's patterns that we see and I think we're immediately attracted to and it makes the question why are we attracted to this pattern is it the balance of it is it the mathematics it's clean and crisp like what is it about these chevron lines that have been used in you know clothing and fashion and all these things and so I know there's this visual attraction for the audience and the viewer, right? And so I kind of play off of that. And so with that, I knew I had this wheel and I wanted this to play against this, both in the texture and the visual, visualness of it. And, right. um, and this kind of builds upon this. So then I see grids here. So I bring that grid up 
And right. For the viewer specifically, you know, I want the goal of the painting is to bring the eye around the piece, maybe sit right. somewhere and come back, and you know, that's you know, a right. successful painting if you're looking at everything and you don't kind of focus on one. Right. Um, so yeah, I definitely think about how people view it. I don't necessarily like do something. Yeah, I don't know. Right. Yeah, right. I, there's definitely intention, but right. it's more for an experience. Right. Of so looking at it. Yeah. yeah. E exactly. And and um, the kind of gestalt thing that happens, like you were just talking about, right? It, it's we. I think as humans, we look for balance, right? Mm -hmm. We we have this kind of design. Our world that's around us is designed and is built, yeah. and we, we we've adapted to that over time. So we know if a door uh, opens the wrong way, we feel it. We we know immediately right. that the design is not right. Brains are wired the, to recognize the, patterns. The brain is wired to recognize patterns. Mm -hmm. So, it, what's interesting in this, um, in this material here, did you come in and draw, or is that in the pattern itself? That is drawn on. Yeah. So what was it about that material, right, when you laid that on there, that you, you didn't think that that material would be enough or, or to, to hold its own in this corner of the painting where you had to come in? Did you feel that you needed to repeat the chevrons coming all the way down? Or? Sort of, yeah. So that was actually the last move I made on this piece, and I sat with it. But without that, it was just this stark black Right. almost whole, right? Right. And it almost directed my eye and attention too much to where, you know, it almost sucked you in right. and didn't allow this part to exist. Right, right, so right, right. So I decided, well, maybe you need some balance. And then it's kind of a play on these clean, real crisp, which took a while to get nice, right? It took right. a lot of time and effort. Right. So then you come in with the opposite, uh, you know, and, just come in and just attack it for right. a few seconds right. and it's kind of talking to this bit as this bit talks to this bit but with that white I think it brings everything to you right. know, well, the yeah, same level. Yeah, yeah. Black, yeah, black and white is such a stark, I mean there's no starker contrast yeah, right than right. black and white. Mm -hmm. And to throw, to have black and white in, in this painting with, you know, these washes of colors, you mm -hmm. know, these teals and yellows, and it's, it is, a, it's, it's interesting, right? It's mm -hmm. a stark kind of thing. And these shapes, you know, being at my age, right, I, you know, this kind of, these cone shapes, um, you know, I think of Gustafson's with, with you know, the, the, he's got the hoods mm -hmm. and these, these, Resonate as hoods for me, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, which is odd. Yeah. Um, but so I love, I love. I think one of the other things that I really am fascinated about your work is the the ambiguity of them, mm -hmm. right? And I I think there's strength in ambiguity. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's some slight forms through there mm -hmm. that, that will take you to a place, but then it's on the viewer to kind of figure out what that yeah. is doing for them, right? Yeah. It's yeah. not really kind of didactic or prescriptive and this is what it is. Right. Um, so that, I, mean, I hate to use the word abstraction yeah. because I know, <laughs> I know we're, this, we were looking at these as more non-representational right. versus abstraction, right? Because right. abstraction, like you mentioned, is probably a bit overused, yeah. right? At um, this point, yeah. At, at, at this point. But that non-representational, there is things in here that will take you to some interesting places mm -hmm. for me, right? Yeah. Strong composition, uh, well balanced, but yet, you know, what's going on? What really is kind of happening in there, mm -hmm. right? Which mm -hmm. I, I, I really love. Yeah, I love creating it because I'll see things too, but I'll never tell you what I see because <laughs> I want to hear what you see. Right? Yeah, right, that's right, right. The joy of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, Sam, um, I wanted to kind of finish on this painting here um, because I was uh, intrigued with it because it's, it's, it's a lot different um, in, in, uh, in terms of it's more minimal than the rest of the work that you have in here. It's smaller in size, um, and I'm kind of uh, really intrigued by the contrast of how much more work you put into the other paintings and how simple this one is. Um, so, and I, I mentioned earlier that I was kind of 
you know, we're so saturated with, um, you know, media and content and to be able to kind of come in and have this focus and restraint to, to, and I think, you know, for me, there seems to be a lot of restraint in this work um, to, to, to get to this point. So um, can you maybe just talk a little bit about um, um, how, well, I, I also wanted to talk about, um, because I, I believe I read that you stretched this canvas first and then you came in and you cut out the shape and then sewed the material back in after it was stretched, which I kind of found that process a little bit counterintuitive. Um, but so maybe you can talk about how that kind of evolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so previously with other works I have, you know, sewn on a textile or fabric and then stretched it and it's very simple and easy to do. But this one I wanted to challenge myself and figure out what happens if you cut a hole in a stretch canvas, is it just destroy it immediately? Um, so yeah, I did that and decided I had this fabric that I was obsessed with and tried to put it in and sewed it in without distorting it too much. And you know, you get that fail in there, but you know, there's artists in the past that used to cut their paintings and it's right. this, you know, it creates this literal space in the piece that I think is there's some beauty to it and you know, maybe it's an ode to life's imperfections. Um, there's another artist that highly influenced by Charlene von Heil. She has this belief of destroying parts of her paintings in order to, you know, it's a, it's, it's a part of uh, subtraction and addition. So you destroy right. something beautiful right. to add a new element to it. And right. So maybe cutting it out, it's kind of thinking about that sort of thing. And um, this piece actually sat in my studio for, I don't know, half a year, months, because I was trying to decide on what to do with it next. And, the, and so, um, so a couple things come to mind. Um, so how important was the gesso, right? Mm -hmm. to, to kind of, does, it, does that then make it a painting, right? Or did it have to be a painting? Or if the gesso wasn't there, is it something else? Right. Is it an object or structural kind of form? Um, so that's interesting to me. The fact that I can see through the hole, right? If this painting was, say, on a red wall, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You've got that kind of color permeating. Mm -hmm. um, I got three questions that are rattled in my head right now, so that's yeah, yeah. two of them. <laughs> and why you were, why were you um, um, enamored with that that pattern? Sure. Right. Right. So yeah. I don't know. That's so throughout my canvas building experience, I always love the gesso part of it. Yeah. I think putting on the gesso and when I always do it I kind of slop it on before you know you spread it out evenly and coat it properly but there's something that's just so visually striking and you know I can't really put words to it but it's almost it just draws me in and these textural gestural marks of just the stark white on the raw canvas and it's just above it so I just decided to leave it this time with the intention to go back and do something later on right um, and it's a historical context the gesso has been applied to linen for Millennia, it's right? Like, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. process yeah. of you know traditional sure. painting and whatnot. Yeah. So sure. to leave it kind of unfinished is like, sure. what's it saying? And like it sure. plays with you. Sure. Um, the whole, you know, yeah, I live with it, but I love the idea of it's. It's almost like a living, existing entity in itself. Because yeah, no matter where you put it, it's going to be a little different. Right. It's going to exist differently in different spaces. Right, like, right, right. If you right. had a light behind this, this little transparency, you get right. this glow behind it, or right. the light permeating might show the wall, or you could see some fabric yeah. if you get close. Yes, you know, exactly, you know, exactly. There's these layers, so yes. it's, it's almost an organic yes. living, correct, you know, being in a painterly way, I suppose. Correct. Um, and the third question. Yeah, third question. So the, um, I guess I guess it was the third question was the, the, the whole, whole right? Yeah. So, um, I can understand that kind of process of when something um, deviates from what you're thinking happens, mm -hmm. and then saying, "Oh, I'm okay with that." Yeah. Um, but I think, I like to say, the most fascinating thing I found about this piece specifically is everyone is so attracted to it. And I can't figure out why. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, I do yeah. all these yeah, detailed, you know, chaotic works, but right. people are so attracted to the simplicity and like this. Yes. I don't know if it's this, the softness behind it or right. just. Right. And 
you know, a bullet, I can't figure out why, because the other ones have so much more intention. This one I sat with, unfinished for so long, decided right. I'll just, maybe it is done. And once you show it to people, they're, you know. Right. Yeah, so it, that's it. Blows it my is, mind, so there's it's, um, something about it. And do, you, do you think that there is some freedom that is, so there are portrait painters, right? There are representational painters mm -hmm. um, that, if they are not executed properly, right, they're very easy to kind of pick apart, oh, sure. right? Yeah. Because like, uh, you, you can see there's a craft issue, there's, right, there's something right. that's right, proportions, right. something's not right. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a bit of freedom within artists who choose to go a route of non-representational or um, to, to, be, to be able to maneuver the process freely and have the freedom to dictate that's okay. Yeah. That's not okay, right? Right. Yeah. It, it seems like we have a lot more latitude yeah. uh, in that kind of space than other painters, mm -hmm. or more representational, mm -hmm. possibly painters. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you find that true, maybe, or is it, do you think? Yeah, I do find it true. You know, um, I think it's a lot on the painter and what they set out for themselves. Right. Because you could be a portrait painter that does, you know, really strange awful paintings on purpose and that's your thing. Right, 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 right. You know, it's all part right. of a belief system. But if you believe right. you want to paint someone exactly how they should be portrayed and then you don't do that, right. then it kind of goes against that belief system. So if you believe that like I have this freedom and you know there's a symbolism to this whole then you know we all have to kind of believe in that and then it's true, right? Mm. Um, right. And I think that's where you know because there are abstract paintings that you could look at, you know like, this failed for some but, reason and maybe yes. you can't specifically say why but you look at it and something's off absolutely and it's the same as if like the ears were different on a portrait and you know you're like that's off and right so that's that, that's fascinating and you know to, to see this wide variety it is a wide variety right of style mm -hmm. and and textures and form right mm -hmm. they you know they all still hold their own through mm -hmm. composition right they're balanced right i think you have a really good sense of figuring out mm -hmm. when something's done right thank you right and so that's really quite lovely and you know the 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 whole there right it is interesting. It could be a metaphor for the whole show, which yeah. is it, right, which is quite, yeah. quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very cool. Um, and finally, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so, what do you think? You know, this is a tough career, right? The yeah. art world is a tough career mm -hmm. um, to move forward and make work, right? Um, a lot of people aren't able to have a studio practice. Yeah. So, what do you think, and uh, how you're going to move forward in your career? I guess. Uh, what do you see in the future for you in, in making art? Yeah, um, well, I think this body of work here was definitely years of exploration for me um, into this new painterly freedom that I've been looking for. Right. And I think I found that, right? So I think, I don't know if I'll continue exactly in this same light as these kind of thoughts and whatnot. I, I think I'm gonna take the skills that I've learned from these transfer them into something else. I'm not quite sure what that is yet. Um, all I can do is just keep creating. I realize, you mm -hmm. know, it's almost a therapy for me yeah. to build the canvas and gesso it and take the time and, and then think about what I'm going to put on that and like just that whole, it just keeps me going and right. it keeps me thinking and exploring life around me. So I'm going to continue that. I think I might explore more down this realm right. because I don't have an answer to why people find this piece right. so successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I want to explore that. Yeah, and yeah, you know, maybe I'll bring in more, you know, representational things into my art and give more hints into like, you know, maybe, you know, um, human shapes or right. animal totem. There's you know, yeah, right, be sure, anything, but sure, sure. I think yeah, yeah. I think I have to constantly evolve and grow and challenge myself. So that's where I'll head. I Excellent. Yeah, as long as I have the space to create. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic, man. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for you doing so much. Yeah, Nice talking with you. Absolutely. Okay.
thank you to Sam for doing the interview and to Stefan for asking him all your excellent questions. Uh, we will have the video up on our YouTube channel quite soon. Um, we appreciate the courthouse for sharing the space with CCAI and to you for watching. Um, follow CCAI on our website, ccainv.org. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and come see our work. We have four galleries in Carson City, all with free parking. Um, so we, we, all of our videos are available. If you've missed a show, they're up on, as I said, on the YouTube channel. Our generous funders are listed on the following slide. Thank you all.